All right. I'm just like staring. We are going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the welcome plenary. And welcome to AMC 2018. Um, and welcome to Detroit for everyone who's traveled here from elsewhere. Um, so I'm Jenny Lee. I'm your moderator for the evening. Um, a quick note, we unfortunately, our ASL interpreter had a family emergency. We won't have ASL interpretation for this plenary, but we will for the forthcoming ones. Um, and yeah, we wanted to start, I'm gonna um, introduce all of our amazing plenarists at once, and we're just gonna dive into um, their brilliance and have time at the end for, um, for Q&A and you know, interaction with you all. So if you have questions and comments, write them down. So at the welcome plenary of last year's AFC, um, we were talking about the anniversary of the 1967 rebellion here in Detroit. We named it Past, Present, Futurism because we wanted to consider what futures might be possible if we shaped our present based on what was needed to heal from the violent legacies of the past. And so this year, we're picking the theme back up, but with a focus on disaster. The resilient infrastructure we need to survive it and the resilient infrastructure we can build after it. And so what do we mean by resilient infrastructure? Um, we wanted to throw out a kind of rough working definition for everyone um, for the purposes of tonight. So we're, we're proposing that resilient infrastructure means systems for the provision of essential resources within a community that are both durable and equitable, that promote dignity and self-determination, and that are designed with the needs of the most marginalized members at the center. Monica Lewis Patrick simply calls this the beloved community. She has been working towards this kind of beloved, resilient approach to the governance of our city's water infrastructure for the past six years, as the city has shut off water to thousands of residents' homes, creating a public health and human rights crisis. As part of We the People of Detroit, and in coalition with dozens of other grassroots organizations in the city, she has organized to halt water shutoffs, design affordability legislation, and deliver water relief to every corner of the city. She's been a mentor to me personally in modeling what it looks like to presume our power and go beyond protest to build the things that we need. Grace Lee Boggs was another Detroit revolutionary who spoke of the beloved community. She believed that Detroit's economic disaster, while devastating, also created the space in which a beloved community infrastructure could grow. We see evidence of this today in the sprawling black farming movement that grew to provide food security in the absence of grocery stores. We see it in neighborhood organizing that provides basic infrastructure where the city cannot. And Diana Nucera has continued this deep Detroit legacy in her work with the Equitable Internet Initiative, or EII. EII is a collaboration between the Detroit Community Technology Project, Grace in Action, Church of the Messiah, and the WNUC community radio station that has set out to build a community-governed internet in parts of the city that major internet service providers have systematically ignored. This work is the extension of more than a decade of organizing and education work that Diana's done inside of Allied Media Projects and in collaboration with the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition to demystify technology. Diana's background as a popular educator shapes her approach as a leader. Everything for Diana is about training the trainer, redistributing knowledge, but also ownership of tools and ideas, and also joy. Um, joy uh, for Diana is an organizing principle, uh, one that she has taught me and infused into Allied Media Projects as a whole over these years. At last year's AMC, uh, an incredible thing happened and it was called the Detroit-Puerto Rico Solidarity Exchange Network Gathering. Was anybody a part of that network gathering who's here? All right. Um, it was organized by Teresa Basilio, Sofia Gaisa, Adela Nieves, and Ariadna Godreau. And its goal was to build solidarity between these two places that were experiencing very similar forms of political disaster, the dismantling of democracy through emergency financial management laws. In Tara Rodriguez-Bososa, 
uh, was part of that gathering and there forged relationships with other food justice activists who, like her, were building infrastructure for radical, sustainable food systems in their home communities. Then Hurricane Maria hit. The relationships forged at that network gathering last year have proven to be a kind of resilient infrastructure themselves, facilitating ongoing exchange of resources and solidarity in the months following the hurricane. In New York City, following Hurricane Sandy and Bill de Blasio's 2013 election, Maya Wiley wrote an article in The Nation called To Help Connect the Two New Yorks, Bill de Blasio Should Build More Community Broadband. She was pointing to a community wireless program in Red Hook, Brooklyn, which had been directly inspired by the work of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, using the same curriculum that Diana Nussera and others had designed and which now also forms the basis of EII here in Detroit. And shortly after that article was published, Maya um, became general counsel for the mayor of the city of New York. In that role, she did incredible work to establish on a citywide scale the kind of resilient infrastructure we need, not only for broadband, but for economic development and racial equity and more. And she is now the vice president for social justice and uh, directs the digital equity lab with Greta Byram at the New School in New York along with at least a dozen other roles that she manages to hold in New York and beyond. Um, and we're going to be, you know, in conversation about all of this, uh, you know, with these, these brilliant minds and, you know, the possibilities um, pre-disaster, post-disaster. And before that, we are going to have the privilege to hear from Jonah Mixon Webster. Jonah is a poet, educator, and conceptual sound artist from Flint, Michigan. His debut poetry collection, Stereotype, contains a poem in it about the Flint water crisis and the resistance following that crisis. And the poem lays bare both the feeling and the fact of what has transpired in Flint. And after hearing that poem for the first time two, two weeks ago, um, I asked Jonah to read it tonight because the truth of what a disaster means has to be the starting point for our conversation. So please welcome Jonah Mixon Webster. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jenny. Based on actual events, the real nigga attempts to survive the apocalypse. Flint, Michigan, January 25th, 2018, prologue. On April 25th, 2014, the city of Flint, Michigan changed its water supply from the Detroit provided Lake Huron water to the Flint River, anticipating the production of a new pipeline scheduled for 2016. Longtime residents of Flint have reported a foul stench coming from the river waters below the Linden Road Bridge on the city's northwest side for an indefinite amount of time. The smell of rot, always. Concurrently, Flint media outlets, city officials, and citizens have reported multiple findings of dead bodies within and near the Flint River, yet authorities Emergency managers Edward Kurtz from 2012 to 2013 and Darnell Early from 2013 to 2015, both appointed by Governor Rick Schneider, ensured the use of the Flint River for the source of the city's main water supply as a rescission to the city's budget. However, the Flint water plant was not thoroughly equipped to filter out the harmful pollutants and residents began voicing concerns regarding the water's noxious smell murky yellowish brown color, foul tastes, and innumerable ailments listed as, but not limited to, rashes, boils, loss of hair, pneumonia and pneumonia-like symptoms, irregular bowels, and vomiting. During this time, coliform bacteria, including Escherichia coli, was detected in the water. Chlorine was added to the water to remedy the damage in response. Between the years 2014 and 2015, an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease spiked the city. Over 90 cases and counting have been reported, along with 12 fatalities. It's more now, that was with the time that I wrote this. Now, from June 2nd through June 10th, 2015, 
Flint residents were frightened by the sound of explosions and soon discovered the city was a testing site for military, military urban warfare drills. In August 2015, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha and Mark Edwards went public with research that would confirm the presence of lead in the drinking water and lead poisoning in the children of Flint. Preventative corrosion methods were never utilized by the Flint water plant, though it is a well-known fact that chlorine is a corrosive agent. The abrasive chemical wore away at the pipes and began releasing lead into the water supply. Now of the effects of lead poisoning, Dr. Hannah Atisha states, lead is a potent known neurotoxin. The CDC, the AAP, everybody tells us there is no safe level of lead. Your cognition and your behavior it actually drops your IQ. The 2015 Annual Water Quality Report remitted by the City of Flint, which was finally made public in July of 2016, also affirmed the findings of chemical byproducts in the form of total trihalomethanes, a carcinogenic compound. During the testing period of January 1st to 2016-2015, the City of Flint incurred Safe Drinking Water Act violations due to these high trihalomethane levels. And through local media, the City of Flint issued and withdrew multiple boil water notices. On May 4, 2016, the 44th President, Barack Obama, made a visit to Flint Northwestern High School to pull a stunt. He fielded complaint narratives, took one sip of clear water, and left. incubation. It is 2016 and the city of Flint says, boil the water. My mother lays her head in a couch of her own hair, pulls back a scar from the watermark in her leg, the scalp of her knee giving to the bloody lock. Faucet water hardens into a fang, attacks, slowly unfleshes the body altogether. This week, my niece goes live on Facebook, on Facebook filming her son running in an errant stupor. Bad as he is already, vaulting up an obstacle of leather, a base from which to rehearse flight. He lands, runs into the carpet, the screech following his shade into the mat. He moves his joints to the finish, muscle where his mind angles the floor. It is 2014, and the city of Flint says, boil the water. My niece, Great nephew and I bow mac and cheese out the aluminum. We all smash it heavy and wet the taste in the soup of our own mouth. TJ plays the last noodle with his finger, consumes it, says, where's the meat? It is 2014 and the city of Flint says, don't boil the water. I lie into a nightmare of sound. Again, there is no rest. The whole house and hood is washed in the voice of some agent installed in the park burn projects adjacent to the crib, tucked in the half of a half of an acre, an alarm, a holler on blast every night from 10 p.m. until we all sleep it off. This lasts for a year despite complaint. Another day starts stretched by the mile of voice sounding off from the intersection of Pearson and Clover Lawn, throwing itself to the undead which lay some distance elsewhere. The broke record of it in the water, in the air, in the dream. Warning, warning. You have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified. Leave immediately. Warning, warning. You have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified. Leave immediately, warning, warning. You have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified. Leave immediately. Warning, warning. You have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified. Leave immediately. Warning, warning. You have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified. Leave warning, warning. You have violated an area protected. The authorities have been notified. Leave immediately. Warning, warning. You have violated an area protected by security. The authorities have been notified. Leave immediately. It is 2016, and the city of Flint says, don't boil the water. I returned to the city for the first time since the story surfaced 
Riding through the hood, crossing at the corner of Pearson and DuPont stands a string of neon stanchions, military servicemen, a gaggle of pallets, a gaggle of bottled waters wishing us well. My boy Q posts a picture of his back bubbling with fissures in an even spread. Having bathed in the city's northeast waters, the contagion carries itself into the host, bearing witness to a feast of skin and other soft metals. Thank you. Oh, can we get Mike and Monica? Um, I need a minute to just collect myself. Um, wow. Give me your water. Well, I have the honor and privilege of being Monica Lewis Patrick, uh, serving the citizens of Detroit in what we know is a right time moment, a right now moment of being able to not tra only transform our thinking, but to evidence uh, in this moment all of the possibilities. And I'm so grateful that I am being able to follow uh, just the genius that we all witness, uh, that we see all the time in places, uh, especially like the AMC. Uh, this is that place you come to submerge yourself with big thinkers that have not only an analysis about what the issues are, but they have uh, really well thought out solutions. And so my work with We the People of Detroit has centered around being always people focused. And in 2009, what happened to us is that as grandmothers and aunts and uncles, we just showed up every day at city council meetings contesting the fact that mayoral control meant that we were going to take away, you were going to take away power away from parents and our ability to decide what was best for our children as it related to education. Little did we know that that was going to throw us into the throes of uh, the dismantlement of democracy. And so what we were able to witness is that we had to deputize ourselves we had to take on the responsibility of the legacy of work that had been established in this city, but we also had to be bold enough to decide that we had to go into new directions. And so some of the work that happened with We the People of Detroit as we were deputizing ourselves is that in, during the bankruptcy, they were massively shutting off water in the city of Detroit. And if you don't know, you're sitting in a city that has cut off over 100,000 households from water, potentially around 350,000 people have been denied access to water. Also what you're sitting in is over 100,000 households have been illegally foreclosed on. So a lot of the devastation that you're witnessing across the city is by design. And of course we knew these things in Detroit because the people most impacted are the experts in their own lived experience. But what we also knew is that somebody had to deputize themselves and actually codify all of this in every way possible. We had to use uh, media making, we had to use graphics and digital design to be able to speak in one voice to multiple audiences. And so out of this work we created, and I believe this is part of this infrastructure that Jenny is talking about, is through cooperative work and through self-determination, some of the first work that started was just being able to deliver water to households that didn't have water. 
And then what we did is we began to caucus with some of our elders who talked about the fact that we had the expertise among us but we needed to connect that expertise in a way that was disseminating a pipeline of information out to our community. And so our partnerships were a part of what was happening with Detroit, uh, Detroiters resisting emergency management. It was connected to Detroit People's Platform. It was connected to allied media, but we also needed an arm that will concentrate on what was happening to water in the city of Detroit. And so we created We the People of Detroit's Community uh, Research Collective. And some of the first work we did was to put maps out that would actually set the record straight that this system that you see that the brother just talked about in Flint is deeply connected to the citizens of Detroit. And the way that that is is that this system, if you look at the top of the T, you'll see that Flint is at the top of that T. Well, this water system was built by the citizens of Detroit, and we provide water to 126 municipalities and townships. 3.8 million Michiganders get their water from the citizens of Detroit, and that very same well, the citizens of Detroit are being denied to access it. Well, somebody would say, that ain't right. Well, no, that ain't right. <laughs> that ain't right. And what we did is we wanted to make sure that you understood what was happening in the city and that we were making it really plain for everybody to understand. And so when you look at the map, you see what happened. Flint was taken off of the De Detroit Water and Sewage Department system because it would weaken and make Detroit insolvent and force it into the status of this illegal bankruptcy. The other thing we wanted to make sure you knew is the history of the system. This system that we were forced to build out to our suburban brothers and sisters, we were forced to do that and legislate it by the state of Michigan to do so. But the debt stays with Detroit. So you have over 78 municipalities in that 126 municipality service region where the citizens of Detroit are paying 83% of the debt service as well as the processing fee for the waste of those cities and they pay 17%. This system was meant to service 2 million people. Right now in the city of Detroit, you have less than 700,000 people, and 174,000 of those are children. When you look at the map, the other thing that people didn't know is that water is sold to our suburban brothers and sisters, it's sold to them wholesale. Detroiters pay retail. All of the suburbanites are actually upscaling their rates to the tune of 100% or as much as 1,000%. And because there's this very racial divide in Michigan, then the narrative is those black folks have failed in Detroit. We're paying for their bankruptcy, when in actuality it's their own municipalities gouging them. But the way that this becomes a tool and an instrument of change is that when we take this information out to the suburbs, they don't know this. And when we begin to talk about power versus parties, we find that we have more in common and we're able to unite our power. And this is what this is about. We also wanted to make it plain in terms of the structural change over the water department. Even though the debt stays with the citizens of Detroit, the governance structure leans toward the suburbs. So the very suburbanites who believe that failed leadership is the reason Detroit hasn't done well are the very people that are benefiting from that very system and its power dynamics. This here was critical because a lot of times people don't understand the racial components of what is played out here in Michigan. 53% of the African American population in this state is under some form of emergency management. 37 states across this country is under some form of this preemptive legislation. What emergency management allows them to do is to set aside democracy, set aside your voting power, carve up unions. So many of the privileges that we enjoy and that we take for granted are totally being dismantled right before our very eyes. This is critical because a lot of times when we talk about these issues, we talk about the issues, but we don't talk where there has been major interventions. When you look at the water struggle, you had major interventions happen. And I want to make sure you take this message with you back to your communities. Yes, there has always been water shutoffs in Detroit. Nobody is asking for free water. We are asking for affordable water. We actually have set the template for what is happening right now in Philadelphia and in Baltimore. 
What we know about Detroit is this. We understand that water affordability is not just about Detroiters getting water. It is about the human right to water. And so this is what the uplift here is about. It's about codifying in language that is very clear that every human being should have a right to water and the right to drink water that is clean, safe, and affordable and accessible. So what we've done here in beloved Detroit is that we have continued to connect that struggle to every struggle that's on the globe. What we know here in beloved Detroit is that every time the people have stood up and resisted this tyranny, they have had to step back and stand down. What I'd also say to you is that you must understand how the dots are connected on a global scale. When you look at just water and you talk about the DeVos family, that family is deeply connected to the privatization of water around the globe. What you must know is that that family is also deeply connected to the privatization of public education. They are also a part of privatizing transportation at many of your airports around the globe. They're also a part of the tyranny that's playing out in Palestine right now. So when we look at the extraction that's happening by Nestle, where Nestle can be allowed to extract millions of gallons out of the water system of the Great Lakes, over $200 is all they pay. And the average person in Flint is paying anywhere from $250 to $400 a month just to access water they can't drink. If you don't have running water in your household in the state of Michigan for more than 72 hours, you're in imminent danger of losing your children and your property. So what I will do in close with this piece of, of work for you, we have a legendary figure here by the name of Coleman Alexander Young. And he told us that if you find a good fight, get in it. Well, I would say to everyone in this room, you have a vested interest in making sure that we protect the Great Lakes because 85% of the bottled water that comes across this country that's consumed comes out of those lakes. Water is a human right. It is a right that we must fight for. And we will not be denied that right in the great city of Detroit. a hard act to follow. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Um, my name is Dinah Nussera. I am the director of the Detroit Community Technology Project, which lives here in Detroit. Uh, but before I get started in talking, um, we're going to talk about the internet, because just like water, I, I do believe we deserve that as a utility that is also free and open to the people. Um, because it was here in the AMC in 2009 in which we discovered that it is communication is a fundamental human right and that the internet is a huge part of that within the way in which we communicate today. So I want you to think about every moment that you use the internet just in the past hour. Can you count it on your hands? <laughs> Probably not. Um, and so think about all the ways in which if you did not have the internet, how your life would change, and how you as a human being would, be, would or would not be able to communicate with your loved ones or even be able to do the work that you do. Well, for many Detroiters, this is not a fictional question. This is a reality. The state of internet in Detroit is quite dire. I think we've done a lot of work, though, to improve it. And so I would say that maybe some of these stats are a little off, because I know that the digital stewards out there in Detroit have changed these. But that's right. 60% of households in Detroit don't have a broadband connection. If you're not familiar with what broadband is, it's 25 megabits per second or above. It takes about 10 or 11 to do streaming or to do any sort of video conferencing. The average around here is between, I'd say, 3 and 7. 40% um, of the households of Detroit have no internet connection at all. And this is fixed or mobile. I think people forget that not everyone has a cell phone or a smartphone. 
And 30% of the residents are living below the federal poverty level, and I believe that is deeply connected to why we don't have a good internet infrastructure. And up to 70% of school-aged children in Detroit have no internet access at home. This is a state of emergency. So what I want to talk about is a little different than thinking about a digital divide or wanting to bridge that, because what that suggests is that it's a simple solution that if you just create one thing to the other, you could solve it. But it's so much more complicated than that, because digital infrastructure is connected to every single part of our lives, our education systems, our governance systems, our water systems, everything. We are all connected in this digital world. We are, we're at the epoch of a digital age. And so I want to talk about what it, what it means to build a healthy digital ecosystem. So not just about getting a connection, but living with technology in a way that is holistic and actually transformative. So back in 2009, I think it was actually back in 2006, people were, the world was asking, is Detroit even worth saving? Which is a completely different conversation of what's happening now. The question back then that the Digital Justice Coalition asked was what will the role of media and technology be in restoring community and creating new economies based in mutual aid? And this is the fundamental question that has designed a lot of the work that we do. Because it's not enough to just build new infrastructure. This infrastructure has to be rooted in local relationships of accountability as well as have authentic communication and also authentic relationships or else it's just another sort of parachute in, we're gonna build infrastructure, and if it crumbles, it crumbles. And as you can see, those of you who have come to Detroit, since the AMC's been here, the city's completely changed. And so in 2009, it was here at the Allied Media Conference, and the infrastructure of this, this organization has allowed for these conversations to take place, and we formed the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. And it wasn't your, your typical form of technologists, it was elders and uh, youth media educators, hip hop artists, um, independent technologists, all coming together with this idea that communication is a fundamental human right. We created a set of principles, and this was key to doing this work. Because what does digital justice mean? It's gonna mean something different to each of us because the way in which we use technology is, in, is based on our individual needs. So we, these principles uh, were created under four categories. And the ones that have created the most impact in the work that I'm sharing today are the two that I'm about to share. That digital justice demystifies technology to the point where we can not only use it, but create our own technologies and participate in the decisions that will shape communication infrastructure. At the time in 2009, this was a pretty radical thought. I think today this idea is actually a little more accepted and known that we have to do this. The other one is that digital justice provides spaces through which people can investigate community problems, generate solutions, create media, and organize together. So in the spirit of media-based organizing, building community wireless networks or doing any sort of collaborative media, it is in that moment that creates those authentic relationships that the knowledge is gained and mutual aid is able to emerge. And so out of all that, we built the Digital Stewards curriculum. And that curriculum has gone quite far and there are many people in this room that I know where I've been a part of creating it and have, have taken it themselves. So if you're out there, let me hear you because I know some of you are in here. That's right. It's not, just, it's not just a curriculum, it's not just an idea. This is a movement of community technology. And this idea that we don't need telecom industries or major like computer scientists to come in and tell us how we build our own technology, that we actually have the brains and the capacity to learn it ourselves and teach each other how to do it and build it in a way that actually makes sense to what we need. And so these Digital Stewards program goes through many, many uh, types of organizing. People learn how to install wireless connectivity, wireless routers, they're climbing up on rooftops doing construction. So our technicians are often, the internet service providers in Detroit often try to poach them because they're not, they're not just into one type of tech. They are well-rounded community organizers that are able to teach and learn with their communities. And I think this is what makes this particular work really powerful, is that we teach them, they teach others, those others teach others, each one teach one, and that's how we're gonna change everything. And so the Equitable Internet Initiative is the work of digital stewards at scale. So this work is not new. We've been building wireless networks in Detroit for the past seven years. 
And not the, the networks that first started don't get nearly as much love as the Equitable Internet Initiative has, but what's interesting with the Internet Initiative and what makes it a little more unique is that we took the opportunity of having a local ISP that was building gigabit infrastructure in Detroit and negotiated with them to purchase wholesale internet. And the fact that we even had the audacity to think that that was possible, I think is quite radical in itself. <laughs> And so yes, it is possible. You can start your own ISP. And you could be a brown girl and do it too. <laughs> Just to bring a few of our digital stewards into the room, this is a class that we recently graduated. Um, what, what we're doing within um, the Equitable Internet Initiative is that we're, we purchase gigabit connections we trained digital stewards. There's about 45 of them that have been trained, 30 of them right now um, that are, or excuse me, 15 that are um, building out these wireless internet um, infrastructure within three neighborhoods um, and seeding neighborhood-based internet service providing. They're building businesses around it and everything. We trained youth in doing gigabit app development because I realized that uh, if the gigabit culture within Detroit is started within community and from, this, from the roots of community, um, then that, that has a way of sort of changing the future of technology culture. But the whole thing is all based in education. I think people think like, oh, what wireless technology are you using? Like, what kind of, what's your speed of gigabit, all this stuff. But really, this is all based in education and you, in the pedagogy, which we call community technology. The pedagogy is based in popular education and is replicating the citizenship schools of the civil rights movement. So the idea is that you're not teaching people technology specifically, but you're teaching them how to learn and how to learn in multiple ways. And it is that that will allow people to adapt along with technology because as we know, this completely changes within the few minutes. I'm sure something new just came out and we're gonna all have to upgrade tomorrow. <laughs> so now that we've built these, um, wireless networks, each neighborhood has an advisory board, they have applications with on those networks, and we're building a resiliency network attached to it where there's preparedness plans, solar generators, portable network kits that will come out and people are gonna organize and use these networks in the case of a natural disaster as well as a political disaster. Because we see those two things as the same thing. And it was during the Trump administration coming into office that we realized that these networks mean so much more than just getting a connection. People needed to have autonomous systems in order to communicate. And you don't know if those systems are actually autonomous unless you build it yourself. <laughs> so there's many steps to this, lots of negotiating, Lots of people just asking them to trust and walk off the cliff with me, with each other. And I just wanted to like say that in order for this alternative infrastructure to come to scale, it required quite a bit of love. Not just love, but trust and also patience. This took seven years to get off the ground and this particular equitable internet initiative took two years to actually get the funding and the connections to do. So I'll leave you with a few questions that I have in thinking about scale. If love is at the base of all of this work, is love scalable? And my last question, <laughs> sorry, I said I was gonna leave two questions. But the last question I have is as this scales, what needs to be put in place in order for the integrity and the values of the work to scale along with it? Thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored. I cannot believe I'm next to the people that I'm next to right now, so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, which way? Thanks. So I began in the Departamento de la Comida in 2010. I was 27 years old. Uh, at that point, we just knew that there needed to be an infrastructure that would grow the local agroecological economy based on needs of people like myself. So we went into the idea of a food hub where you connect aggregation with production, education, distribution. 
And I always actually go back to this model of the food hub every time I want to think about feeding people in Puerto Rico, um, but also taking in mind local land and local crops and local people. So I always thought of this food hub merged with your typical mom and pop store where everybody knows your name. Since the beginning, uh, we knew there weren't many places to model our Departamento de la Comida after. Uh, Puerto Rico wasn't like many other places, or so I thought at that moment. Um, there was no company doing only local produce or only organic produce, and we were very strict on doing both at the same time. Up until the past hurricanes, I felt I was on a broken record every time I shared the story of El Departamento de la Comida. So, I'm very surprised that I'm actually speaking about this right now. Um, everything we're building now goes back to the model of feeding our people that I was really invested in in 2010 and onwards. And we've been doing this and there's a history that I feel at this point, sometimes Hurricane Maria has been trying to eliminate even from my own life and my work. The model of El Departamento de la Comida switched constantly. Uh, we went from a website, virtual platform, multi-farmer CSA in a borrowed warehouse space to a small distribution company that included some restaurants. We picked up produce from farms, we aggregated it, packaged it, organized it into boxes, delivered the boxes, went to restaurants, fought with restaurants. The boxes included newsletters describing the ingredients, some recipes, news from our farms. We marketed at that point with a totally different type of Facebook than there is now and a lot of word of mouth. Um, so things like let's grow some of our own food, let's host events in our space, let's have movie nights on climate change, let's host community garden meetings, let me include homemade recipes based on the weekly box, let me learn how to cook, let's include the nutritional value of these crops. Uh, kale, turmeric, cucumbers, yes, all of these things grow here in Puerto Rico. Tarragon translates into estragón, it's a really good a thing for digestion, we use it in banana shakes, anything to just share um, what we were learning at the same time. So a lot of these ingredients were also not part of the typical Puerto Rican diet. Uh, rice and beans are almost all imported. Pork is 90% imported. Organic greens came from California. I went from telling all my clients that there was no way in hell I would open a kitchen to opening one with an $80 stove. Um, it really started because I was losing produce and I was also depending on the efforts that we were doing and trying to convince people to buy this produce. And then all of a sudden we had to go out to lunch and go to not so great places and we had the best ingredients in-house. So our project expanded, uh, we gained more value as we also continued to create more awareness and we figured out that that had to go hand in hand. Uh, we were moving between ten dollars to $15,000 a month in local sustainable produce and goods. The model didn't fit in the restaurant industry and it didn't quite fit in the farming movement either. We were trying to bring together different sectors, different movements, based on a desire to better meet all of our needs, most of our time and energy being spent on actually creating and adapting this infrastructure that we needed to exist and survive in Puerto Rico at that time. The model of El Departamento de la Comida always shifted according to a few different things. The needs of our farmers, the needs of our consumers and the community around us, our economic situation, be it personal, be it of El Departamento itself, or be it of Puerto Rico. My own personal interests and my own artistic explorations, as you can probably just check out, uh, and that of everybody on my team. Uh, most of the people that I've been working with have been artists and musicians, more than farmers. Um, the relationship of all these people, things, and conditions were what kept us going through all of these shifts and changes. And they were core for our infrastructure at El Departamento. And I think building that infrastructure has been our greatest achievement. So then Irma hit, and then Maria hit, and then before that, Promesa, which please look it up if you don't know about it. And before that, the Jones Act, which please look it up if you don't know about it. And before that, slave-based agriculture, and I could go on talking about the history of Puerto Rico. These hurricanes and the effects of climate change have just aggravated an already devastating colonial catastrophe that is wiping out Puerto Rico, its people, and its land. 
When the hurricanes hit, we knew that El Departamento de la Comida had to shift again. Uh, the hurricane had wiped out almost all of our crops. We were already importing almost 90% of our food, and after 80% of local agriculture being wiped out, we're now to what I say is a 99% of importing uh, food. It flooded our own restaurant space. Um, farms were destroyed. Farmers' homes were destroyed. And honestly, it just didn't make sense to reopen a restaurant again. Uh, we had no crops to base ourselves on either. Um, so what would be the best way to support the work of food and farms in this moment? Um, El Fondo de Resiliencia began the day after Maria. Our main goal is to impact 200 sustainable food projects in the next 24 months after Hurricane Maria. Uh, this includes all type of food projects. This could be community gardens, school food projects, rural farms, urban agriculture, farmers that don't have access to internet, farmers that belong to different organizations, farmers that don't, um, farmers that want to transition to more sustainable practices are very important for me as well. So we are based on five pillars. Oh, cool. Play? Oops. <laughs> there we go, kind of. Uh, thank you. We're based on five pillars, uh, reforestation, rainwater collection, renewable energy, seeds and farming, and most importantly, community wellness. Um, we use a bus, which you'll see in the video. We call it La Guagua Solidaria, which is the solidarity bus. Um, that is our mobile tool where we have a mobile kitchen, we have camping equipment, we take volunteers, a few of us of our team, and we all go every week to a different farm or two or another project and try and be as self-sustainable as possible and also just pretty much be that like matchmaker between people that want to help out, resources, and also being very aware that these farms have enough work on their hands. How can we make it easier to volunteer and help out? So this also means that El Departamento de la Comida's kitchen is now on brigade. Uh, the cook of El Departamento de la Comida, who's Vero, she's actually here at the AMC. She's helping out with the Dream Cafe. Uh, please visit it this weekend. Yeah. She is cooking at different farms every week. She's also sharing that knowledge that we've learned. And an important thing, which for us is very, very essential, is how can we, now that we close our own space, that's 20K less a month towards this movement. How can we start to support each brigade different farmers? Um, and so all of the veggies that we buy uh, come from the same farms that we're trying to support. So most of my time is spent trying to get to other groups, organizations, and volunteers to be part of this ambitious goal. And this is not about relief work. It's about continuing to build on the infrastructure we had already been working on. El Departamento de la Comida had been building networks that gave us more control over what we were eating, who was growing it, our health as a place, and our bodies within this place called Puerto Rico. What we're doing right now with the fund continues a long-term vision of our own food autonomy. So rainwater and renewable energy, for example, they're about to be privatized. It's not a coincidence that we're focusing on those for our farmers. We can produce our own seeds and share them, and we can do all of this work ourselves. So instead of PROMESA, the United States, and any other external forces dictating what we eat and how we should eat it, or even how we should be growing our own food, the fund is supporting us having the infrastructure to be able to do that ourselves. We're a grassroots network building resilience, not bureaucratic relief. That was uh, something that Ora Wise, actually, who I met at the AMC, uh, gave to us as a nice quote. Uh, we're building relationships that will last, not just fixing things after the hurricane. And it keeps land in hand of Boricuas. It keeps us healthy, and it gives us real jobs. Ultimately, it's decolonizing the shit out of Puerto Rico. actually building this all across our networks. There are uh, more than 40 organizers from Puerto Rico right now here at the AMC, and even more Boricuas from the diaspora who are currently working uh, and really just making decolonization a reality. Uh, Palestina, Puerto Rico, Detroit, Houston, Philly, we are all connecting and reconnecting. 
And the infrastructure needed in Puerto Rico doesn't only apply to food on the island, nor to closing schools. Tania, who is an hermana of mine in Philly, is in this room working with hundreds of families right now that are homeless, that just moved to Philadelphia from Puerto Rico. There is no infrastructure to take care of them. She has and will be continuing to create the infrastructure for this to be solved. So after all of this, I've learned in the past few months that if there's anything we should be doing, no matter what our focus is, food, schools, et cetera, we need to support each other's well-being, and nobody's going to do that for us. We need to take care of each other and learn how to do that better, myself included. That is the glue that keeps our infrastructure together, effective, and resilient. I now no longer know why I'm here because uh, so I, I <laughs> I'm I mean it okay so I'm but I, I am moved I'm gonna add something that wasn't part of my prepared remarks um, because I think it's uh, it frames so much of how we started this conversation which is a quote from James Baldwin which is to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. And I think now, unfortunately, we can update Negro and add immigrant and add LGBTQ and add low-income people of any race and on and on and on. Um, so what I'm going to do, I, I'm based in a university. I've been a counsel to a mayor. I ran a national nonprofit advocacy group before that that worked with grassroots groups on these kinds of solutions, really trying to scale up the policies that are necessarily to take the local work and, and make it the seeds that spread, right? This is love scalable. And how does policy help scale that? So I'm going to sort of share it at a, at a higher level, and so therefore I don't know why I'm here. Um, but let me just say a few things in context. So if we think about the context we're in when we're thinking about all these both extreme challenges but also extreme creativity and innovation, we've been hearing about, and, and this is from an Inuit leader, um, Maybel Tooley, who said the earth is moving faster now. And that is actually really true. And it's moving faster in a couple of different key ways. And one is climate change, obviously, which we're talking about. But so fast that literally it's four time, 10 times the rate of climate change that we've seen in 65 million years. Million. We have never seen climate change this rapidly, not just in our lifetimes, but really since before our, you know, anyway, you get the point. Uh, and this is also true if we actually look at technology, right? So technology is changing everything. It's also changing everything so fast, we barely even know what we're changing half the time. So literally in 14 years, one projection is technology will be 4,000 times more advanced. I actually said this, I gave this presentation at the New School, and one of the economists in the economics department said, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> and I was like, nobody does. So we're all in the same boat when it comes to it's just too damn fast and who the hell knows. Okay. Uh, so, and you know, people try to put some, I mean, there's literally, um, how many of you are following, you know, algorithms and biased math? This is basically biased math, right? Are y'all following? Okay. So there's one data scientist who actually did a TED talk. I can't remember his name, but you can look this up. He actually created an algorithm that would help diagnose illness. So social good, right? Two years later, he said he doesn't even understand it anymore because it has gotten so far beyond his own understanding. And that's, so that's just one example, right? So we're, technology is changing us so rapidly. Um, and then, of course, as we all know, they're simply demographic, by which I mean people of color and poverty, right? So, uh, I, and I, I love this quote, which I can't read because I don't have my glasses on, but it's actually from a Supreme Court justice, Justice Brandeis, who said, we may have democracy or we may have wealth concentration. We can't have both. And we are actually concentrating wealth 
at a rate that is more rapid than we've seen. And we're even now going to surpass the concentration of wealth that we saw before the Great Depression. Uh, so t just want two measures on this point, and this is all racialized. I can racialize all these numbers. I'm not going to because I don't think I have to in this room. Uh, and obviously it impacts all races. That includes people who are white but much, much, much more devastating for communities of color for all the reasons we've heard, right? But what, we've, what we're seeing is that literally in 1971, about 61% of adults lived in a middle-class household. Today, it's less than 50%. And there's seven times the growth in wealth concentration at the top. And we're more segregated than we were before the Civil Rights Movement. We've, and, we've, and we've segregated more deeply along class lines. So I say all this because when we see climate change, when we see these technological shifts, we're looking, by some projections, literally 50% of the jobs that we know exist today will be gone. And there's a debate amongst experts about what will replace those jobs. Some say it's not gonna be a catastrophe because some jobs will, there'll be new jobs, different kinds of jobs. It's like, okay, what jobs? They're like, I don't know. Remember that 14? But I'm just telling you, nobody knows, right? And I, I'm gonna tell you, I sit in the university, nobody knows what they're talking about. Okay. But everybody has an opinion. So, yes, and I am paid to tell you the obvious. So, there, there you have it. Um, so, but what that means, <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I, I'm angry every day too. Um, so, so, but, but then if we talk about literal physical in infrastructure, right, not, 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 and we're not even talking about community scale, not because it doesn't exist in community, but, you know, when academics, when uh, the, the American Society of Civil Engineers looks at actual physical infrastructure, whether it's water systems, whether it's parks, whether it's uh, technology, actually broadband isn't even in the equation because it's so private. Um, but we're failing on everything. The only thing we actually don't get a failing grade on, which I thought was kind of astounding, was railways. I don't know why. But we fail on everything else. I mean, school, so, but think about that. We're failing on all our infrastructure, nationally. Failing. And the amount of money that it would take to just get it up to a B, just get it up to a B, would be $4.6 trillion. And we've actually committed as a nation about 55% of that money. And that was just to get to a B. And remember, with all the, the speed with which everything is changing, most of that infrastructure isn't even the infrastructure we need. I, I mean, now we can't just ignore it, because you can't have bridges falling, and we can't have schools falling apart, and we can't. But at the same time, it's like, what's the infrastructure that we actually need in a globe that is changing so rapidly. And what does it mean to think about that in the context of a rapidly changing body politic? Which is to say, no one racial group being a numeric majority. Note I said numeric, I didn't say power. <laughs> but a numeric majority. And if people of color see ourselves as a collective, it would be the new majority, right? <laughs> So that's a very different equation. Um, and if we, I mean, I'm gonna take it back to uh, really some of the work that Diana has been really instrumental in. And think about broadband, because I'm gonna go back to that technology point. Every solution that's not very grassroots and hyper-local that we're looking at from a government standpoint can't happen without broadband. So many of what things that would be adaptive actually requires technology. And at the same time, it's like, and, and what service is that technology put to use for? Uh, so in New York, uh, you've heard some of these, so I'm gonna go through these quickly, but in New York, we've got, we literally have almost a third of our population doesn't have broadband at home. And we're New York City. We're the second largest tech sector in the country. And I promise you that's a highly racialized number, right? This is, this is speeds in Detroit. This is internet speeds. So broadband speeds are what's pink, and Detroit is what's not. Okay? 
So you could take the water analogy and you could put the broadband speed analogy. Now this, the exception of course is the work that Diane is telling you about, right? So these are the green shoots, these are the green sprouts, these are the seeds. Um, but but this, again, this point of seed spreading, also as Diane, Diane said, Red Hook houses, which is public housing, is second largest in New York City, but where the community organized using the digital stewards model, learning, right, learning, one local community learning from another, that they could put up a wireless network. And when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, which was devastating, and by the way, two-thirds of low income, uh, uh, two, in flood zones, two-thirds of the population are low income people of color, two-thirds. And there's a reason for that. It's called a long history of discrimination in housing and land use planning. Um, okay, shorthand racism. So if you take this, right, and so Red Hook houses 5,000 people badly, badly damaged during the hurricane, but literally because of the mesh network that they had up, they were able to take it, it was still up. And the community had a relationship because they put it up together. And then with their national par partner, um, OTI, at the New America Foundation, they actually figured out a way they could add a messaging capacity to the wireless because people did have cell phones. Um, and use that up to 300 people every day getting access to information about FEM what FEMA was doing, whether they could get back home, access to information about resources, finding one another. Um, and then a, a, a for-profit that was in the community actually donated some backhaul to expand it. So this was a form of community, but it was also a form of community that was both local and national. And I think this is really important to recognize a lot of what we're hearing is we need, critically, what we need is local models, the local innovation that we're hearing in trying to address not just whether we have a physical thing, or a deliverable, but whether we have relationships with one another. Yes. And whether in those relationships we're building power. And whether in building that power we're also getting outside of our relationships, outside of the relationships we have in a narrow sense, and building a community that also is connected beyond our neighborhoods, because that's actually how we're going to get it to scale, both from a policy standpoint, because we will need the policy. Because what's happening now is taking the water example, taking the failures of paying any attention to the needs of the people of Puerto Rico, taking into account what's happening at the border now with families trying to cross the border. None of, all of these are policy decisions. And all of our lessons, and here's one, Greta Byram's here. Uh, she can find her, Greta, where are you? My co-director in the Digital Equity Lab. And a lot of the work that she's also helped do. But government, when it does right, and this is the thing we were trying to do in New York City, is figure out how do we as government take these local innovations and figure out how we take responsibility for spreading it. And so we did that by creating free broadband in Queensbridge houses, committing to do it in Red Hook houses, uh, and actually, in this instance, figuring out how in flood zones to connect community partners with local businesses to create wireless and sustainable community, but that's, the difference there is government saying, we know local is innovating, we know community is innovating, how do we take responsibility for scaling that? And I'll stop there. All right. Um, Let's give it up for all of what we've just heard one more time. Um, thank you, all of you. We have about 15 minutes for some back and forth with the room. There is two mics in circulation. There are about to be two mics. Um, held by these two amazing volunteers. Um, if you have a comment, question, we can't see you, but the people with the mics can see you. Anybody? Uh, 
Um, and while people are thinking, if you're still digesting all that was said, because it really was a lot, we took you all over the map with emotion and data and all kinds of things. Um, you know, I want to also open up the floor to each of you to respond to anything that each other said. Um, but I do see a hand now. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's being so polite. Who's on first? Who's on second? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for sharing such um, phenomenal words tonight. <clears throat> I was curious to know what's bringing each of you joy right now in the movements that you're working on. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear what brings you promise and keeps you going. What was it? Joy. What brings you joy in all the work you're doing right now and what brings you promise? Ah. Brings you promise. Okay. Anyone want to jump in? Well, I, I, I will start because, um, well, certainly what brings me joy is actually learning from phenomenal local leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like I learn every day. Uh, and what, what brings me great promise is all this work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because I really meant it when I said no one has solutions. I mean, people have ideas, but I think at the end of the day, despite how scary those numbers were that I shared, there's huge opportunity then to innovate and recreate and change. For me, hello? Is everyone's mics on? Hello? Up in the booth? Hello? Is everyone's mics oh, on? Hello. Hello. What brings me joy in doing the work from the Equitable Internet Initiative um, and the work of the Detroit Community Technology Project is the people involved there. We're family. We didn't know each other before. Um, and now it's like, it's amazing to watch them talk about this complex tech and configurations. I don't even know what they're talking about anymore. I don't need to. And that's what brings me promise. <laughs> Frankly, what gives me joy right now are all the mulberries all around Detroit and Philly that I have been feeding myself off of for the past week. Um, I also am very much uh, with Diana, uh, with all the family that I have had that has housed me for the past eight months. Um, and definitely, I just think what brings me joy is the fact that all of the work that we're doing, I am feeling it in my daily life, and I think that's really important, um, especially after situations like hurricanes, to actually just see that even though within this lifetime we're not going to be able to solve that many things, that I actually feel that effect in my community. Um, I think what's giving me both joy and promise right now uh, we're all here. We're all still alive. We're all still, you know, able to breathe and still do the work. Um, we've lost a lot of people. I know everybody in this room has lost someone. Um, but us being here, us still being alive, and us still being able to, you know, fight, do the work we're supposed, to, we're, we're trying to do, we're supposed to do. Um, that has got to give you joy. I hope, I hope you all have the same joy because you are still alive right now, uh, and you made it here. And, and I hope it also is a self-fulfilling prophecy um, that life will just keep, keep on living. Uh, and we have to do it. So. Mm -hmm. I think for me what brings me a lot of, of joy is seeing uh, the intentionality of how the work is being uh, engineered and orchestrated right now. I've never seen people uh, so open to push themselves beyond points that they really weren't willing to go before. And then I think in, in terms of uh, promise, uh, I think it always for me rests with our children and young people. Uh, the kind of leadership that I've seen demonstrated just over the last year in terms of, of structural violence and gun violence uh, gives me great promise in terms of the future. And what I see right now is a right now leadership void. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm excited about that. There's some in the back, some over on this side, one over here. Uh, is it over here? Okay. Um, bueno, bueno, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Bambi Salcedo. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Bambi Salcedo, and I am with the Trans Latino Coalition. Uh, um, well, first, I, wa I want to say thank you so much for um, all your amazing work um, and for your knowledge, for sharing your knowledge with all of us. Um, as we know, trans and gender non-confirming people, right, like we are resilient. We are survivors of many different things. Uh, we thrive to the best of our abilities, despite the multiple challenges that we encounter in our everyday life. Um, I guess my question for you is, if you can all share, um, how is it that you actually fund your projects, right? Like, who do you go to? I saw some foundations, some government entities that actually support, but one of the things that I'm finding as a leader of an organization who started as a grassroots organizing and efforts in our organization, uh, now that I am in this position of entering into the nonprofit industrial complex, right? I, I see myself um, often have to sort of like, um, I guess, think twice about if we're gonna call people out or shut things down because they are people who are employed at our organization and they're also clients who depend on the services that we're providing. Um, so I guess, how do you find a balance, but how do you also make sure that you serve the people that we are supposed to serve That's right. and not really thinking about where the money is going to come from? Yeah. Good question. That's such a good question. You can say, yeah, I mean, that was a, as we were preparing for this conversation, that was actually a, a, a really big theme that cut across everyone's work is this question um, about the inside, outside strategies and how, you know, once successful grassroots projects are able to gain access to certain forms of power, how to navigate that. So I would love to invite you, Monica, to start by answering that one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple of things, and I, I just want to be straight up about it. Uh, we, the people of Detroit, up until 2014, we were self-funded hmm. and never got a dime from anyone. Uh, up until last year, we were very limited funded. Uh, our position has been to always enter in every space as a truth teller. We believe that the space we hold is for those that are not in the space. And so we have an obligation to tell the truth regardless of what dollars are on the table. Mm -hmm. But what we've got to also recognize, and this is for all of those that are, are dealing with in the industrialized uh, funding complex, is that that ain't somebody else's money, that's your money. Okay. <laughs> so if we start from that, okay. that framework, okay. we don't have to call people out, we can call them in. Mm. And so part of that calling in means that there's sometimes we've got to do some self-work to show up healed and whole mm -hmm. so that we're not emotionally harming the movement with our harm and our hurts. We also have to be prepared that in these dialogues to understand that sometimes the legacy of fight and struggle comes into the room where there's really an opportunity to negotiate and move the agenda. And so we've got to be willing to do the inside work so that we show up in a way that is promoting the outside work. And some of that as it relates to LGBTQ. For us, Allied Media actually challenged us as an organization not just to commit to tolerance, but begin to move past tolerance as we were doing our youth development work to begin to talk about this in a way so that LGBTQ becomes family and then identities become the other part of the conversation that we're educating our community on. Right. But if we continue to come in spaces and I don't come out of this space changed, okay. then the question should be to me, why do I continue to come to this space? Because I'm either not bringing something mm -hmm. or I'm not astute enough to bring, take something away. Right. And so we've got a moment, and I would challenge you to do this. Be willing and bold and courageous enough to go into the room 
with the people that have money and have power and state what you need and what you want. Be clever enough to put the people around you that can help you codify it and put it in writing. Mm -hmm. And put some measurables and accountability with it so that you're able to evidence to your community how they're progressing their agenda. Because where people are stuck right now is in what can't be done mm -hmm. or what's not getting done. And what we're saying out of this work, this is a movement of incubation that we get stuff done in Detroit. And I'm hoping that you, wherever you are, are incubating yourselves that you're getting shit done. Okay. You know, we don't have the choice. And I'll leave it here. We don't have the ability in this moment to sit on our laurels. Dr. King said the hottest place in hell is reserved for those that would sit idly by in the time of peril and say and do nothing. Mm. At ANC, mm. we do something. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Hello? Uh, my question is to each of you working in your different thematic ranges and areas. Um, it's what does solidarity mean to you uh, and what does it look like manifest? Well, just, this also I think connects to the last question too because when you're dealing with something like the internet, um, it's like everybody, no matter what your political position is, your gender, your race, or whatever, like everybody needs it and is using it and um, should have access to it. And so there's this, uh, what I've been learning is that um, it's really hard to confine such things. And when you talk about solidarity, I feel like for me, um, I wanna be in solidarity with the planet you know, like not just a particular people. And it's that our positioning as natural beings on this earth, I think have in understanding what that means and understanding like how we're, there's all this interconnectedness, not just between us as humans, but all of the things in our environment and being able to tap within that, to me that that's what I think of when I think of solidarity and that, that those lessons from understanding your position within the natural environment, I think, have deep lessons in understanding how to, to have empathy with each other. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I'm a, coming from a different vantage point since I'm based in a university or have been based in a national organization or government is, um, it's a little, it's a, it's a more complicated question because you have all this power in relationship to the people you want to be in solidarity with, right? So mm -hmm. there's the challenge of recognizing that you have a lot of power and privilege um, uh, at the same time that you're trying to get something done together and you have a lot more information sometimes, mm -hmm. right? And so, and I've actually been teaching this um, at the new school when, because we have a digital equity laboratory where we're, we have students actually working on projects with community stakeholders as part of their education, but so that they're actually doing something, not just learning to learn, but learning by being in community, in relationship, working on projects with people. But one of the things that I really feel is critical for solidarity is truth telling. And sometimes that means actually disagreeing. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the greatest mark of respect, I feel like I can give someone who I have more power than, at least in the narrow sense. I don't believe I have more power in the human sense. But, but let's face it, in the specific sense I, mm -hmm. I typically do, is to honor and respect them by telling them actually what I think mm -hmm. and what I know, even if it's, even if it's not even if they're not gonna agree with me. Mm. Um, because I think the greatest solidarity comes not necessarily from agreement, but from mm -hmm. actually being able to challenge each other with really hard questions. Yeah, I mean, and adding on to that, I think solidarity for me comes with the senses of looking, touching, listening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of that um, this might sound kind of silly, but 
if I'm about to have a really difficult discussion with somebody, I've learned that looking each other in the eye and just like really having contact um, is a really good way to maintain that because I think that what you said is very important as well and how to do that is for me showing solidarity. Oh, please don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because like, I think in some ways I've gotten um, kind of bored with the term solidarity. I don't feel like it's solid enough. It's so easy, like, I'm in solidarity with your brother. <laughs> oh, solidarity, sister, solidarity. <laughs> solidarity. But, <laughs> but, but I, you know, like when something go down, when a, you know, when a police officer pulling me out of my car, out of my Impala, and I get charged with two counts of resisting a peace officer, <laughs> where you go? Like, where, I thought it was solidarity. <laughs> you know? So I think I think we I, I think I think we we rely on some of the language, some you know, some of the phrases, some of the languages that we you know we we just have at our at our deployment because we're still looking for for more meaning of, you know, in our actions. We're still looking for more meaning in our relationships. Um, and I think that we're, you know, and, and, and you know, because of that, subsequently, we're still looking for new language that can accommodate for those relationships that we really do want to have with one another. So I think that there, in some ways that, you know, um, you know, just because of, there's so many things to be in solidarity with and, and you know, for and because of, that it has become too easy to just say, I'm in solidarity with you. We actually need something more concrete um, than just this, that phrase. Um, it actually can't hold the, 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 the material of our relationships, right? Um, so we, we need something more than that. Um, we need, maybe not even just a phrase, we actually need to just be like <laughs> really like you know around we need to be there we need to figure okay what is it that you need how is it that can help you what resources right we, we need actual we just need more material we need more tangible things we don't need a phrase anymore oh somebody okay uh, uh, is somebody are they all right back there is everybody okay 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 everyone's good but yeah so i, I think we need we just need something more concrete we need we need something more. We don't need a phrase. We need, we need actual infrastructure. It's <laughs> That's similar. what solidarity is, infrastructure. It feels, <laughs> when you're saying that, it reminds me of um, someone that's like, yeah, like it's like just pushing the like button. Right. Yeah. Where that, I guess it does something, mm. but. Exactly, yeah. like pushing the like button. It's just, it's so easy, you know. It's you so easy just... to say, right, it's so easy to But you have great models of, of solidarity. Mm -hmm. And I think if we lift up each other's stories mm -hmm. of where you're seeing that evidence, you. Yeah. You see with the Flint water struggle is that they never let go of the fact that they were in solidarity with the water shutoffs in Detroit. Mm -hmm. You see that the women of the Arab Spring sent messages to the mothers of Detroit and Flint that we stand in solidarity with you in terms of the water struggles there in your community. The mothers of Ireland sent messages to the women of Detroit saying, thank you for continuing to struggle for the human right to water. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that that's another part of, of our struggle is that we don't do a good enough job. I think there's good work happening in pockets of uplifting this narrative of resistance and revolutionary solidarity. Well, that's, okay, revolutionary, <laughs> that's what we have. Okay. That's it. Well, we're going to right. those places. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. what you just said because mm -hmm. I, think I, I think that's how we show up is we're mm -hmm. not feeling the solidarity, right. but then when we start pointing to those revolutionary that's moments. Right. Then we can say, this is what we need. Yes. Right. Yes. I, I like that. But I love your now. I think that's what love looks like at scale. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I, I was thinking about, oh, sorry, Jenny, if I'm, no. there's supposed to be more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Take us home. Not on. good at following rules. Take us home. Um, no. But I was thinking about like how, like Bill, doing the work that we've been doing, all of us, I'm sure there's been an immense amount of self-transformation that's happened, an immense amount of self-doubt that has happened, and that the communities that we interact with and the relationships that we have held us to be able to keep doing that work. I don't know how many times I thought, like, this is not going to happen. This is not going to happen. And just rejection after rejection until it did happen, and then it became this huge thing. And in, in how the role of solidarity, I think, is to keep people going and keep people moving. 
And I remember, like, and if anyone is a part of Postcard Underground, thank you. Because I received 30 messages from these random people that, did, that were anonymous saying their love for the work and their love for everything that like, allowed us to keep going. And I think, and I, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have a panel ask a question and be able to answer it at the end. But <laughs> I think that it's, it's this revolutionary solidarity is what love looks like at scale. Yeah. That's, okay. that's really beautiful. All right. that's cool. Well, on that note, um, to a weekend of revolutionary solidarity and scaling up our love, thank you all. Dinner at the Dream Cafe, $19 all-you-can-eat yes. buffet, Pan Latinx. Yes. And then the Firehouse Music Series Welcome Party, because after the Welcome Party plenary is the Welcome After Party party. And then there will be more parties. So uh, yeah, at the DIA lawn. Anything else? OK. Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated, y'all. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you all so much.